Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Harmony Insights lunch date. My name is Eric Kershaw. I'm the owner of Harmony Insights LLC, a company that allows me to work with organizations and consultants using primarily the DISC personality assessment, much of which is done, as you can imagine, online these days with assessments and, and workshops, bringing folks together for really meaningful conversation about how we're wired and how we want to connect meaningfully with other people. A teaser for our topic today. Um, I'm also the founder of the HR Hot Seat Inclusive Mastermind Community. We have over 2,600 members at this point in 10 different chapters, licensed chapters around the country. And as we say it, we're a, a mastermind community of real HR pros solving real HR problems. I'll put a link to that in the chat area, but you can find out more about us if you are an HR practitioner or you serve HR professionals, you can find out more at hrhotseat.com. We would love to have you. It's entirely free and these days entirely virtual. You have joined us today for a lunch date. I started doing these a couple of uh, months ago because so much was happening in the world and I, very selfishly, for 30 minutes of my lunch hour, wanted to reconnect with people who would inspire me to do my best work. You know, if I read headlines or I saw what was going on in the world, I wasn't always as inspired as I could be, especially when, when COVID hit and uh, we're trying to make our way through that. And so I thought, well, if I can talk for 30 minutes with somebody who really kind of picks me up and, and encourages me to do my best work, then my afternoon will benefit. And why not bring other people along for that conversation? And that's where you all come in. Today's discussion is with uh, somebody that I have been hoping to have on for quite some time. And there's a story around that that we may or may not get to, but I'm just thrilled to have him as my special guest today. And that is Steve Brown, the VP of HR for La Rosa's Incorporated based in Ohio for a conversation entitled, Make Your Connections Real. Steve Brown, welcome to today's Harmony Insights Lunch Date. Hey Eric, how are you, man? <laughs> I am doing fantastic. Wait, I want everybody to wave, go stupid. <laughs> hopefully, that fun? Some, hopefully someone got a screenshot of that all the introverts are going no stop it <laughs> i'm thrilled to have you as part of this conversation and let me before you say a couple of additional things by way of introduction let me say this i heard early on uh you referred to as the most well-connected person in human resources and as i did a little work i saw that you're on stages all over the place in front of thousands of people. You have a fantastic book out. You have a newsletter that's read by thousands of people across the world. Um, you're all over social media. And so I immediately think, well, this is a guy who does stuff at scale. You know, that, that explains his connections. Then I send you an email and say, Steve, you know, I, I've been inspired you by you in these ways. I would love to get on the phone for a few minutes with you. You agree to get on the phone. You call me on your way home from work. I get more than the five minutes I was hoping for. And at the end of the conversation, you say, don't be surprised if I reach out to you randomly to find out how you're doing. And I realized that Steve Brown isn't connecting necessarily with people at scale, that you're connecting with people individually. And it's something that, that really set the tone for how I would perceive you going forward and how much respect I have for you as a connector. I wanted to start out our conversation that way because I think it's a really important point to make. And I would love for you to tell people a couple of additional things about yourself and why you chose this topic for today's discussion. Okay, first of all, wow. Uh, it's nice to get on th something and have somebody get humbled. Hey, here's, here's what I think about you. You're freaking amazing. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, here's the thing that you need to know about me. This is natural for me. I enjoy people genuinely enjoy people. I can be in a room with one person and be completely encapsulated. The challenge I have is when I see the next person come in, I want to pull them in and pull them in and pull them in. Uh, some people think it's a shtick, unfortunately, until they get to meet you and then they can decide. Um, but it, every person I meet, I want to know in depth. And I think you can do it. Uh, the, the challenge is, and we'll talk a little bit, is capacity. You know, knowing people just to collect them, that's creepy. <laughs> but, but knowing people to say, I, this is what I value about you and what I hear about you and I want you to know about me, if you can take the time to do that, then it'll have meaning. Um, the big difference, I think, between myself and others is, uh, to me, people matter. 
and I think other people want to know people for an agenda, a reason, a, an, out, an outcome, a result, uh, that's fine, but I want to know you because you matter. I would love to hear from you. I, people may know that I choose my guests and my guests choose the topics. And it may not surprise you that the majority of the guests that I've chosen over the course of the past couple of months have picked topics related in some way to meaningful connection without my prompting in, in different perspectives, you know, different sure. ways of looking at it, but they quite often come back to meaningful connection. Why did you specifically choose this topic for today's conversation? Because I don't think people do it well at all. I think people struggle with this and, and I wish they wouldn't. Um, we get overwhelmed. We get um, lost in it. We think it's just uh, a waste of our time. What people want more than anything in their lives is to be connected to other people. Yeah. It is. I mean, whether that's within your family or within your workplace or within your social group, you, you desire that connection. There's a yearning to have it. So uh, when everything happened with COVID, with virtual, people are like, oh, you, know, you can't connect virtually. Well, sure you can. It's easy. What's funny is if we were in a room right now with each other, would we be more connected? possibly but you know to assume that just because we see a bunch of pictures on the screen we're not connected i think is short-sighted uh, so to me i want people to have people in their lives that they can depend on that they can reach out to that they can be honest with that they can be genuine with we tend to make it very transactional and there's so much more to having connections than being transactional yeah I've said in some, I do workshops on professional networking and on occasion I've included a slide that says when it comes to relationships, um, proximity does not equal meaningful connection because you're near people, you're in the same room or you've hit the connect button on LinkedIn. <laughs> Don't get me started on the connect button. It's, <laughs> it's the beginning of a meaningful relationship, but it doesn't end there. And just because we're close to people or like I, I had a guy reach out to me recently on LinkedIn, I accepted it. He didn't personalize his invite, with it, which is another story entirely. And then I saw the little picture at the very top by his profile picture and it was the big, a uh, big number, 18,000, which told me that was the number of connections he had. And I realized I was a number. Sure. You know, and that's that's certainly not what I'm looking for. What is it about? Um, you know, you do a lot of speaking. There are probably a number of people in our conversation today that that know you and your background, but I would love to make it very clear right off the bat that you are an HR practitioner. Yes, you you speak quite often, and you're regularly found on stage and in other places, but you are a practicing HR professional. Can you tell us just a little bit about how that molds um, how you view meaningful connection? The people I value are the people I'm with or the people I get to see. In fact, when I get done with this, I'm going to my pizzerias because I'm going to go see the people that do great work and the people that take care of guests. And to go into a pizzeria as the head of HR and value somebody who's a 16-year-old cook makes my day, just brightens my day like you wouldn't. And plus, I freak people out because I'm tall and I can come in and I walk in and they're like, oh no, HR is here. Uh, and and I don't think people have enough fun at work. I don't think people have uh, enough joy and laughter. So if I can come and be a light in someone's day, and that may be this, go to somebody and hear what they have to say and not judge them. Hear what they have to say and just listen and not solve something. Just be there for them, acknowledge people. So for me, this isn't a thing, um, social media or LinkedIn or speaking, those are bonuses but my day-to-day -day connections are what matter. Yeah. You know, to find out, uh, Shauna, who's my amazing HR manager, uh, showed me a connection of her, or not connection, a picture of her new puppy. I'm like, we went puppy crazy today. And she's so excited about it. And she should be, because it's a new part of her family. Yeah. Those five minutes looking at the cute puppy, and it is a cute puppy. <laughs> uh, um, that was more meaningful than her taking care of the three tasks that we had to get taken care of today. Yeah. I know she'll do that because she's amazing as a performer, but the time I spent talking about her dog is far more uh, critical. Agreed. And I think that that should happen naturally with all employees. 
And that leads us to the first poll. I put together a couple of quick polls today to, to engage people and allow our attendees to chime in. They're doing so in chat. If I'm having a hard time following everything, everybody, but I'm glad people are including their LinkedIn URLs. They're talking about pizza. By the way, Steve, you remember I sent you home addresses for everybody on the call today. Did you have the appropriate size pizzas <laughs> sent to everybody? <laughs> I, they're, they're in the mail. <laughs> Um, when it comes to COVID and the fact that we are working from home, a number of people when they registered included questions about, okay, how do we even begin to connect with people now that we're sitting in front of computer screens? And to your point about, she was able to show you pictures of her dog in the office, but we're learning a lot about people and how they live by virtue of seeing them in their homes. For example, if I were to move out of the way, you would see a Dyson cordless vacuum on the wall behind <laughs> me, right? Um, you have a sense of, of where I am, what I value, and if you're able to see around me, you'd see quite a bit more, obviously. I wanna launch this, this quick poll that asks uh, our attendees today, has COVID-related quarantine made it easier or more difficult for you to connect meaningfully with others? I think we could assume one or the other, but I'm really interested to see how this, this sort of pans out. In our conversation today, I promise people that we will touch on challenges related to our topic of meaningful connection and then leave them with actionable tips. So I'd love to spend some time, Steve, talking about what you perceive as challenges that we are currently facing um, related to connecting meaningfully with one another, um, maybe especially now that we have spent so much time at home. I think the big thing is we've tried to systemize communication in organizations everywhere. How, how we communicate electronically, how we communicate in person. Uh, it was funny, we had a Zoom meeting with our corporate office because everybody was working remotely for a while. And some people were in the office and some people were remote. And we put them all up and we had the big gallery view like this. And the first thing we did was, well, let's get started. And I said, wait, let's say hello. And everybody's like, hello. And they waved and I haven't seen you in so long and it's the best thing. You can't keep trying to make rules around communication. You have to allow people to communicate. We're trying to stifle the emotions of people and the biggest challenge of connecting now is the emotional strain that people have. And we don't address it. We get right to the business because we're on track and we're performance oriented. And in, this, in the back, you're like, what's in this background? What's this that? Is that? Is that a ficus plant? I love ficus <laughs> plants. You know, or Jeff Kalkowski has the llama. And he's my favorite, by the way, uh, <laughs> for having that up. But um, we spend time looking around. And what's funny is instead of, it shows how much we don't communicate before. Sorry, that's poor grammar. We didn't communicate well before. Yeah. We just never did. It was in, out, get done, move on. Something's more important. Instead of saying, now that I have your attention, give people time to breathe, be emotional. Uh, allow them to express themselves verbally and non-verbally. I love the people that never say anything on a Zoom call verbally, but they say volumes non-verbally. They're like, they're bored as hell. Oh my gosh, look at that person. I think I'll fire them later because they tell me they're a higher performer. You know, it would be fun to get on a Zoom call and say, so if no one contributes, you're fired. Then see what happens. Um, but we don't take the steps to emotionally engage. And you have to do that when it comes to connections. If you're not willing to be emotionally vulnerable and upfront right off the bat, it's going to be surface at best. I love that point. And I want that to carry us into a question that I had for you, which means by saying that, that I'm immediately going to forget the question I had for you. So you may have to remind me of the vulnerability piece while I get to the, uh, the poll here. So I want to end the poll and show people that... Um, I have to allow someone in from the right weight room, but then I share the results and we see 60% people of the people said COVID has made it easier. That's so interesting to me to connect with others. 40% uh, say more difficult. And then um, Wendy Daly in the chat section suggested that we should have had a third option for about the same. And that is my bad. I should have included an option for, for no change. But what do you, what do you make of this, uh, Steve, that 60% of our attendees are saying it is now easier not being face-to-face -to, -face, um, to connect with folks. There was an event that uh, called the Festival of Work that CIPD did overseas in the UK. And there was a gentleman, and he's on Twitter. I'm not gonna tell you his handle right now, but he has agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. He can't be in crowds. And he was able to participate in an HR conference 
because it was virtual. And then he wrote a blog about it. It was phenomenal. And what we've lost sight of is we've had to become agile and adaptable. And we say how people oriented we are until I'm not in front of you. Yeah. So now you had to really learn how to be people oriented because now you're on a screen instead, or, you know, I get 40 minutes before I get kicked out or those kind of things, but it's allowing people who have struggled to connect, connect. And the extroverts are the ones who are suffering. I'm telling you, uh, Laura, who I see in my upper right-hand corner, uh, <laughs> Laura and I are so crazy extroverted and John Baldino, who's down there, if we could, we'd talk and never let the rest of you talk. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who are introverts yeah. are well aware of that. <laughs> and, 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 and I think the extroverts are like, they're saying my connections aren't as meaningful because they need to have that uh, instant return. Yeah. They would exchange an like, external ex return. But I think this has allowed people who are more thoughtful and more process driven and can be better thinkers, a better forum to do it. So I think that's why they say it's easy. I've mentioned that as, as we are now whisked back to our office spaces in, in many instances to, for people to keep in mind that we, some of us are going to um, say, hallelujah, it was about time I needed to get back. And others of us really have enjoyed how things have been. Certainly not the COVID piece of it, but the fact that, you know, I've been able to loosen up my schedule a little bit, you know, clear up my, my calendar, connect with people in ways that are, are more comfortable for me. Um, so coming back to the workplace, we're going to have different responses. Even as an introvert myself, um, in the beginning, I was loving this. I mean, it was right up my alley. And then it got to a point where I was like, I just have to freaking walk to Trader Joe's to talk to <laughs> a cashier. You know, like yes. I needed to have that, even as an introvert, have that one-on-one -on -one interaction that was face-to-face -face because I wasn't being fulfilled in the ways that I ultimately wanted to be. Yes. You mentioned vulnerability before. We could go all over the place with this conversation, but I want to make sure I come back because I promised I would. Um, one of the notes that I have is that when I have seen you on stage, so there's one-on-one -on -one connection, but then there's one, one to many. I've seen you on stage in front of thousands of people at, at CHIRM conferences, and I have seen you be vulnerable on that stage in ways that are so endearing, that make me as an audience member, as an introvert, as whatever you want to call me, feel so connected to you in the moment, even though I'm sitting in a sea of people. As somebody who is not only connecting one-on-one, -on -one, but one-to-many in that venue, what is it about being vulnerable and being authentic and showing true feeling that you think is resonating so much with your audience? That's a, wow. Um, I don't take myself too seriously as a person. I am flawed. I'm goofy, I have foibles just like everybody else. But if you say something that's funny, if I say something from the stage that I think is funny and you laugh, I'm laughing because it's funny. You know, if it's uh, emotional or cry, if I can't cry in front of you, if it freaks you out that I cry in front of you, I'm gonna cry more. <laughs> I mean, it, the thing that is hilarious is we want people to be genuine sort of. You know, don't bring all that junk. And, and like, which one of us doesn't have life? And so if you have a room of thousands, uh, the last time I spoke at Sherm, there were 3,000 people in the room. And the way I look at it is, if I could get inside each person, I can look at you one-on-one, -on -one, even though there's 3,000, because you chose to come see me. You could have done a million other things. You chose, and that, that should have value. And I, I'm afraid too many people put up walls because of a lot of real reasons. They've been hurt before. Uh, there are creepy people. There are people who will take advantage of you. My thing is, bring it on. Let's go. Uh, I think when, uh, and I just wrote about this, this sounds horrible, but let me do it. It's just so pretentious. Go for it. In, in my new book, <laughs> uh, it says, um, I said, uh, you, you, um, you don't earn trust, you give trust. You earn credibility. If I'm credible, you'll trust me. If I'm not credible, you won't trust me. We have to. We keep saying, "I don't. I have to. You have to earn my trust." Well, then who the hell's going to trust anybody? Because you can never do enough to earn someone's trust. I will fail you. I will fail you today. You know, because I'm a human. However, credibility I can work on. So, to me, if you're credible, you have to be vulnerable first. Have to. If not, it's just a big facade. 
and people hate fake people. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate that. And I'm sure a number of other people do. And I, I thank you for that response because it helps us have a, have a better sense. I think you hear the word vulnerability quite a bit these days. You know, I know Brene Brown has done a lot of research on it, but I think vulnerability is just one of those words that means something different to different people. And uh, I think quite often, sometimes, uh, quite often, sometimes, quite often emotion uh, is sort of wrapped up in that definition. And so that's something that I've always appreciated about you. You mentioned your book. I know you have one coming and we can talk more about that. You also have one called HR on Purpose. And those of uh, those people on the call that know you or have interacted with you have received especially uh, written communication from you or seen your posts know that there's no accident that these two exclamation points are on the front of your book. And so I know Steve Brown is somebody who's gonna use specifically two exclamation points after most sentences. And even more re remarkable to me, have a space before them. So they are sort of dangling out there as just this independent statement in and of itself. What is it about you, how you're wired, whether it's extroversion or, or otherwise, that you think is, um, captured so well by these two exclamation points, this energy that you were bringing to the connections that you make? I think there's a couple of things. Um, I, I am not a, I'm a contrarian. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm not a good authority person. I'm a contrarian. And when people said that's grammatically incorrect, I'm like, really? Then let's use it all the time. Uh, because it makes a statement to say, you can be overly passionate about stuff, about life, you can capture the day, you know, instead of a poster on a wall, it should live within your heart and pop out of your soul. But uh, I see it, I love stories about children. When children talk to you, until they get to about three or four and we ruin them, uh, the first four years, they're out of their minds about everything. You know, they'll see something and go, I just saw a cat. Oh my gosh. And they probably have 20 cats. And then we go, oh, hey, life comes along get back in line, get back in line, get back in line. And the older we get, the more conformity we expect. My thing is be passionate in spite of that. People want to have someone to have joy, to give them and to share with them. And I don't care if you're the most miserable wretch in the world. Um, you got to have that. Now, fun story. When Sherm did the book, uh, I t said in my contract, if I can't use double exclamation points, I won't write the book. Oh, really? And they said, cool. So they let me write it. But the person who designed the cover said, we can't put two exclamation points on here. It's grammatically incorrect. <laughs> and, and, and Matt, the publisher said, look, if you don't do it, we don't get this book. You've got to do it. And she did it. She goes, you, have you met the guy? Have you met him? Because if you met him, two's not enough. She says, we're going to put two. And then I, I found her. I went to the headquarters and go, hi. I heard you have a problem with double exclamation points. And she's like, oh my gosh. I said, let me show you what some people have said about it. So the good work that you did changed people in the profession around the world because you were willing to put one extra exclamation point on a book. And she was, oh. So it wasn't to shame her. It was just to show her that by thinking differently, you can really pull people along. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it really makes a statement and, you know, reading into it probably more than I should, as I usually do, I, it really just got me to think about what you are bringing to your connections and the energy that you have put not only into your book, but into your efforts um, to connect with other people. And I think it's fantastic. I think that they removed the space before them, which is such a, a travesty because I think that that's part of the, yeah. that's part Edit of the punctuation. Yeah. Editors. But what are you going to do? <laughs> Um, I am, so we, I, if you can believe it, only have a few minutes left. And as I promised in the beginning at 1230, we will encourage people to stick around if you like, you know, leave if you need to, but you're welcome to stick around so we can continue the conversation. But I want to make sure that we end on actionable tips that you have for people. And as our attendees registered, they included some questions that they were hoping that you might answer. And I think this will tee us up for a, a couple of tips that we can leave people with. Diane specifically asks, um, let's see what she asked a few really good things. Um, now this is, this might make, make you think an action item that you feel is underused when it comes to making connections. So either face to face online, it probably doesn't matter, but what is something people could be doing that they aren't doing? 
to me, it's follow up. So uh, we, we can get past the personalize your LinkedIn things. That's just normal. Just do that. If you hit the connect button, I'm still going to connect with you, but I'm a freak. I'm going to connect with you because I want you. But most people, it, it shouldn't be a transaction. It shouldn't just be a task. I was told to connect with people. So now I have 100 connections. No. Follow up is the next thing. So when I said, Eric, I'm going to call you, I call you. You sure did. Okay. So, <laughs> so don't, what's missing is that extra step. And honestly, you do that once or twice and all of a sudden you start getting calls and I can, there are people on this call right now and I won't call you out, uh, but I make phone calls to them just to see how they're doing. Yeah. I don't call to say, so how's that project coming and what's new in your life? How are you? And stop and listen and find out how they are. Yeah. And you'll be amazed because they are giving people and no one's asking them how they are. Uh, the whole issue you see on a lot of posts right now about self-care, uh, connections involve care on both sides, the people you're connecting with and yourself. It's not just always the people you're paying, uh, the others. You should focus on others, but someone should focus on you as well. And I love how you have in your book, the last couple of chapters are near the end are a couple of, uh, one about your community, sort of finding and building your, your community and also uh, doing the work of networking. And I love one of the things you say on page 126. <laughs> uh, HR people long to be connected. There's a ton of comfort, stability, and joy in having a circle of peers who are your friends, which really implies that the dialogue, that it's a back and forth in a two-way street, like you were just saying, it isn't just me connecting to you in sort of this one-way thing, but it's how can this be a mutually beneficial or rewarding or fulfilling or inspiring relationship going forward if we both want that? Exactly. I think it, it gives more uh, long-term stability to it. One last question, one last tip we'll ask of you. Yvette and Angie both asked something along the lines of how do you build genuine rapport and, and, and be of intentional service in front of a computer? I think you ask questions that matter. What's funny, uh, my wife is an introvert. Uh, as much as I am an extrovert, she is not. And so we got together on a Zoom call uh, uh, with people and she said, hey, what TV shows have you been watching? So she asked the question and that's all she did was tee it up. And then we listened and say, I'm watching this, I'm watching this, I'm watching this. They didn't say, so what are you doing? Yeah. What's your job like? We asked about life stuff. So I think is it, we keep thinking that we're losing time. We have more time than we know what to do with. It's how we choose to use our time. So I do want to know what you're watching because you might find something. I go, oh, I haven't watched that. I'm going to check that out. And it might be a guilty pleasure. Somebody said on the HR social hour, they watch Bravo shows, those train wreck shows, you know, housewives of something, something. I'm like, oh, but you know what? It mattered to them. And I'll listen to her. Yeah. And, and listen to that. I, and I think it just valued what other people do in their lives more than what they do in their work. With a shout out to the HR social hour, half hour podcast with John and Wendy. I, I listened to that as well. All right, uh, Steve, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, far too short, but that's kind of how these go, just bite-sized discussions to encourage people to do their best work as the afternoon comes around or whatever is on their plates. Um, I want to ask you, you know, people are going to be inspired by this conversation. They're going to want to learn more about you and, and the forthcoming book that you have and your views on Meaningful Connection. How can people find you online? Two places primarily. Uh, I'm on every platform, sort of, except Snapchat, because I think Snapchat's from the devil. Anyway, <laughs> um, LinkedIn, absolutely. But understand, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, it's on. I will find you. I will talk to you. I will find out all about you, and I want you to do the same. And Twitter. I think Twitter is incredibly a great place to have conversations every day about everything uh, and encourage people and lift people up. So on LinkedIn, Steve Brown with an E. Twitter at S Brown with an EHR. I'm there. Just look me up. You'll find me. Excellent. Well, I, um, I'm so appreciative that you were willing to join us for this conversation. I'm going to follow up with all attendees of this um, conversation via email, blind copying everybody with links to various resources that we've discussed and maybe that we haven't included, uh, including a link to, to find Steve's book, certainly among some other things um, that he may want to share with all of you. So watch for that uh, to come uh, either today or tomorrow. If you enjoyed this conversation, I really hope you come back for more by going to harmonyinsights.com. 
slash lunch dates. Uh, Steve and I happen to have some common friends, both in um, not only with John and Wendy from the HR Social Hour podcast, but also in Jennifer McClure, um, among yes. some other people. And I am speaking with Jennifer, the CEO of Disrupt HR, uh, next Friday. Um, I'm really excited about that conversation, some others around diversity and inclusion. And then also I'm doing uh, pretty soon a third, in, um, a third instance of what I call a pop-up panel, where people show up and in the moment I choose panelists, this time on the topic of vulnerability as it happens. And uh, those people who have volunteered to be panelists then uh, get the focus or get the, the spotlight for our conversation. So. Um, it's been going really well, and, and I, I'm excited about this third pop-up panel that we're doing. Uh, if you'd like to uh, register for any of these, you can do it at harmonyinsights.com slash lunch dates. As I said at the uh, outset, we, you're welcome to go about your business now. I know some people have already had to. If you have an afternoon to get to or something scheduled, um, please go to it with our blessing. And... Uh, stay healthy and encouraged in the meantime, certainly. If you'd like to stick around, um, this is gonna be an opportunity um, for you to contribute to the conversation um, by unmuting yourself. But in the meantime, Steve, just let me reiterate how, how appreciative I am that, that you'd be willing to spend at least a half an hour of your day with us. Oh, it's fantastic, way too long that we didn't do it before. <laughs>